Hey guys, Pete here. Today I decided to pick back up on a series I started a few months ago. This will be my attorney at Heron Hall part two video that will talk about how Alan Reed ended up there in the first place. No spoilers here about current events, so if you like looking at how the backstory influences the Game of Thrones TV show, this will be right up your alley. Plus, since it's Thanksgiving time, all of those in the US should remember to give thanks to Howland, since it wasn't if it wasn't for him, none of what we know as Game of Thrones would have turned out the same way. In part one, I talked about the tourney itself and a lot of the underlying politics that were involved. If you haven't watched it yet, I'll put a link at the end. You don't really need to watch them in order, but to recap real quick, the tourney at Harrenhal was a grand event that drew people from all over the Seven Kingdoms to compete for tournament prizes that were much larger than normal. Aerys II Targaryen was king at the time and was on the verge of being completely insane. His heir, Prince Rhaegar, won the tournament, and his decision to name Lyanna Stark, Queen of Love and Beauty, led to the series of events that would see Westeros plunge into the War of the Usurper. No matter how you look at it, the tourney at Harrenhal was the beginning of the end for the Targaryen reign. Of course, there were other things going on which might have seen this happen anyways, but in the end, this is the event that started things in motion. If the tourney is the event, then Hallen Reed is the person. You may be thinking, wait, don't you mean Lyanna Stark is the person? After all, she was the person who was crowned the Queen of Love and Beauty, but no, actually I think Hallen and his present there is more important. After all, if he didn't attend, the She-Wolf wouldn't have had to defend him as her father's bannerman. In part three, we'll talk about Lyanna and Rhaegar, but in this video, we'll focus on Hallen. Hallen Reed, who we've only seen briefly in the show in the Tower of Joy flashbacks, in which, by the way, he saved a young Ned Stark's life. If Hallen didn't kill Sir Arthur Dane, Sir Arthur Dane would have killed Ned. If he killed Ned, then there would be no Sansa, Arya, Bran, or Rickon. And of course, a young Jon Snow would not have gone to Winterfell to be raised by Ned. So you can see this little talked about character in the show is pretty crucial to pretty much everything we've seen go down. One of the reasons I decided to make this video now is because I read an interesting take on the chapter where Mira tells Bran the story, which was written by Reddit user Tanafort. It's framed a little differently than what I've long thought about Howland's importance, but it touches on the same points more or less. After I read that, which I'll put a link to in the description, Howland and the attorney kept popping up in my head. Mira tells Bran that Howland was a curious lad that was small like all Cranig men, but brave and smart and strong too. He grew up doing normal things like fishing and hunting and climbing trees, but also learned all the magics of their people. He could breathe mud and run on leaves, and change earth to water and water to earth with no more than a whispered word. He could talk to trees and weave words and make castles appear and disappear. This is an impressive group of skills with his ability to talk to trees as being the one that stands out most to me. The children of the forest can also talk to trees and Bran Stark is learning how to do this with the help of the three-eyed crow. Mira continues, the lad knew the magic of the Cranigs, but he wanted more. Our people seldom travel far from home, you know, we're a small folk and our ways seem queer to some, so the big people do not always treat us kindly. But this lad was bolder than most, and one day when he had grown to manhood, he decided to leave the Cranugs and visit the Isle of Faces. As she tells the story, Bran is shocked by this and says that no one visits the Isle of Faces. He then asks Mira if Halen met the Green Men. To this, she says yes, but doesn't get into it because she says it's another story for another time. Hopefully this is a story that we'll get to hear later, and if not from Mira, hearing it from Halen himself would be pretty awesome. Taniford mentions in his Reddit post that he feels certain that we'll hear about it from Howland in the Winds of Winter, which is an idea that I wholeheartedly support. After being at the Isle of Faces for a season, which remember is not a regular three month period like our seasons, Mira tells us that Howland heard the wide world calling him and knew the time had come to leave. He said his farewells and paddled off towards the shore. From there, Howland decides to stop at Harrenhal for the tourney to take in the spectacle of the whole thing. Not long after arriving, he's jumped by three squires who were likely around 15 years old, but much bigger than him. 
Per Mira, they saw this as their world, and the little frog eater didn't belong in it. They basically knocked the spear out of his hands, knocked him down, and started pummeling him until Lyanna Stark saw what was going on. The Starks are the Reed's liege lords, so she jumped in saying the squires needed to leave her father's man alone. She basically chased them away, then took Halland back to her tent to dress his wounds. While there, Halland met her three brothers that are described as the Wild One, which is Brand the quiet one, which is Eddard, or Ned, and the young one, Benjen. Lyanna tells Halland of a feast that night to open the tourney, and she insisted he should attend. She said he was of high birth and with as much right to a place on the bench as any other man. He mentions she's hard to disagree with, and then he borrows some clothes from Benjen and agrees to go. That night he ate and drank with his fellow Northmen. Prince Rhaegar sang a song so sad that it brought Lyanna to tears. Lord Robert Baratheon, the future king bested the knight of skulls and kisses in a drinking contest. Halland recalls a beautiful woman with dancing purple eyes, Ashara Dane, dancing with a member of the king's guard and several other men. The list of her dancing partners is Sir Barristan Selmy, Prince Oberyn Martell, Lord John Cunnington, and Ned Stark had the last dance. It's worth noting that Ned was too shy to ask her himself, so Brandon had to ask her to dance with his brother. Mad King Eris shows up at the event even though he hadn't left the Red Keep for years. Check out the part one video of this series for more info on that. He made Sir Jamie Lannister kneel before him to swear the oath of the Kingsguard. Jamie was only 15 at that time, but was well admired for his courage, gallantry, and skill with the sword. While all of that stuff was true, the king almost certainly added him to his Kingsguard to take his hand, Tywin Lannister's heir, away from him. After the oath, Aerys sent Jamie back to King's Landing to watch over his wife, which effectively robbed him of his shot at glory in the tournament. While the party was raging, Halland spotted the three squires who roughed him up attending their knights. Lyanna saw them too and pointed them out to her brothers. Benjen told Halland he could probably put some armor together and get him a horse if he wanted to try to take them on in the tournament, but Halland passes on this since he doesn't really have any skills that translate to jousting, and he fears he'll just get beaten. And beyond that, he's afraid he'll completely embarrass himself and be made to look like a fool. Eddard offers him a place in his tent to sleep for the night. The part that's always stood out to me after reading it a few times is what Halland does next. Before going to sleep in Ned's tent, he goes to a lakeshore and says a prayer to the old gods. He looks across the water to where the Isle of Faces is to do this. Then, in something that looks like a direct response, the next day his prayers are basically answered. The three knights whose squires attacked Halland advance in the tourney. But late in the afternoon, as the shadows grew long, a mystery knight appeared in the list. If you're not familiar with the idea of mystery knights, they're actually a bit more common than you might think. Different people might enter different tournaments, well, in disguise, I guess would be the best way to describe it, for a number of different reasons. So someone showing up and taking people on without anybody knowing who they are isn't that completely out of the question. This mystery knight had a shield that was painted with a heart tree of the old gods, a white weirwood with a laughing red face. They were also short and clad in ill-fitting armor that was cobbled together from different suits. The mystery knight dipped his lance before the king and rode to the end of the lists, where the five champions held their pavilions. Predictably, they challenged the three knights whose squires had attacked Halland. Whoever the mystery knight was, the old gods gave strength to his arm. All three knights fell before the champion was soon called. When the fallen foes sought to ransom their horses and armor, the knight of the laughing tree's voice boomed through his helm and told them, teach your squire's honor. That shall be ransom enough. Once the defeated knights chastised their squires sharply, their horses and armor were Turned. And so basically the old gods delivered a champion for Halland to answer his prayers from the night before. In his essay on the chapter, Chanifer goes into some ideas about knights and knighthood, which are interesting and you should read them, but that's his take which isn't really essential to my thoughts on this whole ordeal. What I find interesting about Halland as a character is that one day he up and decides to further his magical abilities by going somewhere that people just don't really go to. Now I'm not going to get too much into the Isle of Faces since I'm planning on doing a video about that all by itself. But basically, it's this island that's right in the middle of things, but no one ever goes there. There's plenty of legends and stories of people trying to reach the island and something happening so they don't actually make it ashore. 
But really, the only thing we know about it for certain is this is where the children of the forest and the first men made their pack all that time ago. So Howland wakes up one day and decides he's going to go there. He has no problem getting there. And then after staying there through the end of the season, he decides to go to the biggest tourney that has ever happened in the Seven Kingdoms. Now, that's not all that surprising considering the scale. But what is surprising is that winter didn't actually end right then. This is known as the year of the false spring because a false spring popped up, but then after a while, everything just went back to winter. So he gets there and this happens and he meets Lyanna and the Starks. And then that all leads to this crazy mystery night showing up. And from there, we all know what happens as far as Lyanna and Rhaegar are concerned. Like I said, I'm going to get way more into that in part three. So basically, Howland shows up, shit gets all messed up. And then at the end, a giant war breaks out. Like it doesn't break out that day, but it breaks out pretty shortly after the events of this tourney. And you could also think about the idea that, thing, it, you know, King Eris coming may have already foiled a plot that Rhaegar was planning to put together. That's not important here at all, but just, you know, it's there was a lot of stuff going on leading up to this tournament, like I said, I went over in part one. So for a long time, people have thought that Howland's major role in this story is to be there later to verify John's parentage. I think he may play a part in that. Most likely he will. Even in the show, I think that. But before we even get to that, he's already played a huge role in the way things played out in the story thus far. So that's the long and the short of what we actually know. Hallen went there, he met the Starks, and because he was attacked, a bunch of events were set in motion that ended up rearranging everything in the Seven Kingdoms within a couple of years. So the speculation part, and what I've always thought that was interesting to think about at least is if he could talk to trees even before he went to the Owl, was he guided to go there? And then was he also later guided to go to Harrenhal? We've seen this happen. We've seen Bran have dreams where the Blood Raven has sent him north of the Wall. And he's accompanied by Hallam Reed's two children, one of which is a green seer who basically got the idea through his green dreams. But what goes beyond that, I think that's a thing that a lot of people have obviously thought. But what goes beyond that is, is when he had, when he goes and he has as his prayer was Liana then guided to stick up for him. If you're wondering like how that would work, like how the children or the old gods knew about the tourney, it happens that Heron Hall has a heart tree and it has a god's wood that covers about 20 acres. So it's definitely possible that they knew that this was all going down and that's how Hallen ended up there in the first place. Now, there's no really way to confirm any of that stuff, but it is interesting that we now see Bran on this similar type of journey that has implications in a conflict that is pretty freaking important as far as everyone in Westeros is concerned. So what I ask you guys is, what would this mean for the children of the forest and their influence on events in the Seven Kingdoms? We know that they were once involved in a great war against man and they pretty much wanted to wipe them out. But have they also been pulling the strings here and there to pit men against themselves whenever they see an opportunity? Let me know what you guys think and don't forget to like the video. Do you think we'll see Howland again? If so, what kind of role do you see him playing in the future of the series? And this could be the book or the TV show. If you haven't read the books and wondering where Howland's been all this time, so has everyone else. He's basically been a mysterious character that everyone sort of assumes will eventually pop back up. What are your thoughts on the children? Are they political players in the Seven Kingdoms that no one really realizes? And what do you think we're going to see from Bran now that he can talk to the trees as well? I am having a book giveaway right now, so subscribe if you want to enter. All you have to do is be a subscriber and leave a comment on this video or any of the other ones where I mention this particular giveaway. When I hit 28,000 subscribers, I'll be giving one lucky commenter a copy of the new 20th anniversary edition of a Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin. So definitely subscribe and leave a comment for your chance to win. I will be adding a part three to this series. I'm not sure exactly where that's going to fit into my schedule of videos, but definitely check back for that in the future. Thanks for watching. I'll talk to you soon.